Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Lane. I'm the technical sales support manager for the Americas for Fermentis. Uh, I have the pleasure today of talking to you about combining lactic acid bacteria and active dry yeast for sour beer production. Uh, primarily, we'll be talking about kettle souring uh, during this presentation. Um, have a lot of interesting information to bring to you. Uh, so hopefully you learned something today. Um, without any further introduction, I'm just going to move into this. Uh, so today we'll talk about really kind of an introduction to sour beer production, um, more or less going over some, I would consider more traditional souring processes, more historical souring processes, uh, and then kind of show where the kettle souring process is if you're not familiar, uh, just to get a focus on where we are or what we're talking about today. Uh, the second point we'll talk about is kettle souring optimization. So key parameters for you as a brewer to control. Um, and with that, uh, we'll take a look at it. It's really more for for you to to see, to understand, and and to um, kind of make decisions on in terms of what your target is in the end and how to achieve that. Uh, the third point that we'll look at is the beer characterization. So the sour wort fermentation, the lactic fermentation, and then applying yeast to that for the alcoholic fermentation, uh, and then how those fermentations carry out and the organ organoleptic profile, uh, sorry, of the, the resulting beers. And then the last thing, we'll just take a look at some conclusions um, from all the information included in this presentation. So starting out, um, you know, I hope all of you are familiar with this. This is just uh, the typical brewing process. So you have your milling of the grains and then mashing in, loudering, uh, taking that to the kettle, boiling, going to some sort of clarification like a whirlpool, um, and then going through cooling uh, to fermentation, carrying out the alcoholic fermentation, probably going to some sort of maturation and then to package, whether that's bottle, keg, can, uh, whatever it is. So this is really the traditional brewing practice uh, in more normal beer, per, beer production. But today we're talking about sour beer. So uh, just to point out a, a few different types of sour beer production, and again, this is going to be more of the traditional approach, the historical approach. So you can do primary mixed fermentation, uh, potentially in oak barrels uh, for lambic or goose type production. Um, it's not necessarily limited to those types of beers, but those are just examples uh, where you do a mixed primary fermentation with multiple microorganisms. A second way to do sour beer is to do a co-inoculation of yeast and lactobacillus for beers that are typically, you know, Berliner Weiss type beers or style beers. Also, it's important to notice here that when you do the co-inoculation with bacteria, you're going to have a very low or you target a very low IBU in the beer. Uh, that's because the bacteria in general can't handle too much of the isomerized alpha acids or, you know, hop compounds. So you keep that to a small amount so that that bacteria that you're co-inoculating is successful in implants and, and produces the acids that you're looking for. A third way is going to be a mixed secondary fermentation. So you do the normal beer process through fermentation, then you go to a secondary fermentation where you do mixed, a mixture of different yeast, bacteria, those types of things. Typically, this will be carried out in, in oak fooders, in Flanders red ale type beers, um, and then go to bottling after that. Now, today we're going to focus on the kettle souring. Uh, so here's where you see the kettle souring fits in. So you do your typical brew day, mashing, laudering, but then when you're done laudering, when you're done clarifying the wort, you bring it to a boil for a short period of time, not for hopping. We're not adding hops at this point in time. We're just boiling for sterility. Uh, then you cool that to the lactic fermentation temperature. So here we have 30 to 40 C. That's typical of what, what brewers will do. They'll pitch the bacteria and they'll let it kettle sour. So although it's called kettle souring, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in the kettle, um, but just in a, a tank. Uh, and then after that lactic fermentation is performed by the bacteria, which can take 24, 48 hours, you go back to the kettle or you stay in the kettle and you boil again, at which point you're going to be hopping. So this is post souring that you're hopping this beer. Uh, and then you carry through the process, boiling, clarification, cooling, fermentation, maturation, and then to the package. 
Now, today we're specifically going to talk about two different types of bacteria for this kettle souring process. So the first one is uh, Lactoplantin bacillus plantarum. Uh, Fermentus has a product called Saf Sour LP652, which is a plantarum. Uh, I'll probably switch back and forth between the two, the, the genus species and also our, our product name, just because I'm used to talking about that product. Um, but the plantarum is a homofermentative bacteria. So it takes one glucose, you can see at the top of this um, biochemical pathway and converts it to two lactate. Uh, so two lactic acid molecules after that uh, fermentate, the lactic fermentation. The other option, uh, we have a brevis in our portfolio called Saf Sour LB1. Uh, and this is going to be heterofermentative. So you can see that there's a decarboxylation uh, from the glucose moving down. And then after a certain period, there's a branch where one part of the glucose goes to lactate to a lactic acid. The other can either go to ethanol without the presence of oxygen or in the presence of oxygen can produce acetate or acetic acid. So that's really the definitive point between homofermentative and heterofermentative bacteria is that homofermentative just take one glucose, go to two lactate, Heterofermentative take one glucose with a decarboxylation, go to two pathways, one to lactic acid, the other to either ethanol or acetate, so acetic acid, depending on the presence of oxygen or lack of oxygen. So today we're going to talk about uh, the different parameters that you as a brewer can control in this lactic fermentation and how that affects both the homofermentative, the, the plantarum, and the heterofermentative brevis in the lactic fermentation. For each of these, we'll take each at one at a time, the pitching rate, then the, the starting gravity of Plato, the temperature degree C, and then the oxygen anaerobic or aerobic. And we'll look at the acidification kinetics in terms of pH, and then we'll take a look at the organic acids produced in a quantitative measurement. So the first thing we're going to start with is the pitching rate. So here on all of these slides, you'll see the, the variable component, which is the pitching rate here in the upper left. It's going to be one gram per hectoliter, 10 grams per hectoliter, 100 grams per hectoliter. And then you see the control conditions in the upper right where it says 12 Plato non hop to wort, 30 degrees C anaerobic conditions. So that's control. The, the experiments are going to be the upper left, the different pitching rates. Now with the different pitching rates uh, on this first graph, you can start to see some, some things that we'll continue to see through the rest of the presentation. Uh, that being that the SAFSAR LP652 or the plantarum uh, actually achieves a lower pH compared to the LB1, the, the brevis. And again, that's going to be related to the acids produced and the quantity of acid produced. But in general, we can say that when you increase the, the pitch rate of the bacteria from one to 10 or 10 to 100, you see a faster souring, a faster drop in pH, and achieving slightly lower pH in every step from 1 to 10, 10 to 100. Now, taking a look at the acids produced in that ferment, in that lactic fermentation, uh, we have it here. So the plantarum on the left, uh, and you see it that it's primarily from producing lactic acid. There's a small amount of acetic acid, uh, but it's really not a driving flavor or a driving byproduct of this lactic fermentation, whereas on the right with the brevis, you do see a significant amount of acetic acid produced in all three of those. Uh, you can also see that when you increase the amount of bacteria that you're pitching from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, in both with both bacteria, you see an increase in acid production um, for each step. Also on these, on these uh, slides that have the the uh, acids produced, you can see that there's one measurement at 24 hours which is the gray bar, and then another measurement at 48 hours, which is the blue bar. So you can see the progression of acid produced uh, at those two measurement points. Next, we'll take a look at the gravity. So how the gravity affects these acidification, uh, acidifications and the amount of acid produced. Again, this is going to be 8, 12, 16 Plato. The control conditions are 10 gram per hectoliter and 30 degrees C in anaerobic conditions. Here, we start to see some interesting things that uh, don't necessarily make sense when you're looking at a pH scale, that as you increase the starting gravity, you're not necessarily increasing the amount of acid produced or 
relatively decreasing the pH at an equivalent rate. In fact, you see somewhat the opposite. So at 8 Plato, we see the fastest drop. We see the best pH drop in these lactic fermentations. At 12 Plato, it's a little bit slower than that. And then at 16 Plato, it's even not even reaching that terminal pH, uh, which is really interesting um, when you think about it, because it isn't necessarily that there's less acid being produced, but that when you increase the starting gravity of these lactic fermentations, that uh, you have more buffering capacity coming from the, the ward itself. Uh, and we'll see that right now uh, when we start to look at the amount of acids uh, produced in these lactic fermentations. So here, this is just zooming in the, the LP652, the plantarum. Again, remember, we're seeing a slightly higher pH with the higher gravity being at 16 Plato, but it doesn't mean that there's less acid produced, which you can see here on the right, represented by the bar chart, that in each sequential increase of, of gravity, you do in fact have more acid produced in each step, uh, albeit that the gravity of the wart is actually contributing to the buffering capacity of that wart. So when you take a look at the 8 and 12 Plato, just as, as an example, sorry, uh, you can see that at 8 Plato at the 48 hour mark, the lactic acid concentration is slightly over three. With the 12 Plato at the 48 hour mark, it's slightly over four. That's a one gram per liter of lactic acid difference. However, they're at the same pH. So that one gram of lactic acid difference isn't affecting the pH because of the buffering capacity of the wort. Likewise, you can see that there is still an increase in lactic acid from the 12 to 16 Plato, albeit not as intense, not as uh, immense of an increase, but um, there's slightly more and still the pH is higher with the 16 Plato, which has more acid than the 12 Plato. So it's not, it's not the amount of acid, it's actually the buffering capacity of, of the wort itself. Now taking a look at both the, the plantarum and the brevis side by side, Again, we see similar things that uh, when you increase the starting gravity, you increase the amount of acids produced, both lactic and acetic for LB1 for the brevis. Uh, and we can see that um, really, even though the, the pH on paper looks like it's higher, which it is, uh, there's actually more acid in the 16 Plato versus the 12 and the 12 versus the eight. So increasing the gravity will increase the amount of acid produced, uh, just won't show necessarily with pH. Next, we'll take a look at the difference in temperature. Uh, so this is really interesting to me personally. Uh, I guess I learned some things when I saw this the first time. Um, but again, this is going to be four different temperatures, 30, 37, 40, and 45 degrees C. The control conditions are going to be 10 gram per hectoliter of pitch rate of the bacteria. It is 12 Plato wort, non-hopped, remember it's non-hopped, and anaerobic conditions. Here again, we're seeing similar things where the Safsar LP652, the plantarum, is going to achieve a slightly lower pH compared to the LB1, the brevis. Um, we also see that the preferable temperature for achieving the lowest pH is actually at 30 degrees for both bacteria. Uh, however, if you're at 37, it's also a very significant pH drop. And then you can see that once you achieve 40 degrees, you're starting to kind of deter the bacteria from producing the acid. And once you're at 45, uh, there is no acid production from the bacteria. And we'll see that on the next slide. But what I think is really interesting and, and something to remember from all this information that I'm presenting today is these are all control factors that you as the brewer can control, right? You can control your pitch rate, whether you do one gram, 10 gram, 100 gram per hectoliter, you can control your starting gravity. Uh, you can control the temperature of the fermentation. And uh, the, the last topic that we'll talk about in this section is going to be the anaerobic versus aerobic and how that plays. But I say all of that because these are control parameters for you as the producer, as the brewer, uh, that you can alter to achieve your target acidity or your target kettle soured beer. Now, when it comes to the temperature, I think that this is one of the main, it's a very easy to control parameter. Um, and what you can do, what I usually talk about when I'm presenting this is, maybe your target isn't to produce as much acid as you can in as short of a period of time as you want. 
right? Maybe your 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 target is to produce a sour beer, but that isn't overly sour. Uh, and temperature is just one of the variables that you can control. Say you start at or you do the lactic fermentation at 40 degrees because you want to control that acidity a little bit. You're not looking for a immensely tart kettle sour. Uh, so you're you're targeting, you know, a higher temperature for the lactic fermentation to kind of restrain the bacteria a little bit. Or the flip side is true also. Maybe you're looking to get as acidic as you can in as fast a period of time as you can, in which case you'd probably do this lactic fermentation at 30 degrees. Um, it's all dependent on what your target is in the resulting beer. Now, taking a look at the organic acids produced, uh, again, the plantarum on the left to the brevis on the right, the plantarum you see really very minimal acetic acid production. And you can see as you increase temperature, you see that there's less acid produced at each temperature set point. And once you achieve 45 degrees C, there's no acid produced even at the 48 hour mark. So in case you're wondering, you can save money and just not add bacteria if you're going to do this fermentation at 45 degrees because it's the same result. If you add bacteria or not, you're going, not going to have any acid production. But again, this is these are ways to control how much acid is being produced by the bacteria in a set amount of time. So again, back to it, maybe you're not looking for as sour of a beer. So you do, you decide to do a slightly warmer um, lactic fermentation temperature, or maybe you're looking to get as acidic as you can and you want to hone in on that, that peak uh, acid production temperature, which is probably going to be right around 30 degrees. We noticed that with both of these bacteria, temperatures higher than 37 degrees really impact the lactic acid production uh, for both strains. So again, maybe that's your target, but if it's not, then try to stay within that comfort zone for the bacteria, 30 to 37 degrees, and uh, they will be quite happy and produce quite a bit of acid for you. The last thing that we'll take a look at in terms of the kettle souring portion of this presentation is the anaerobic versus aerobic conditions. And with that, um, you know, I think this is a really interesting aspect uh, for both bacteria, in fact, um, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. But I think that this is really a, a key component for for sure if you use the brevis, but also if you use the plantarum to be aware of. So again, the anaerobic versus aerobic conditions controls are going to be 10 gram per hectoliter, 12 Plato non hopped wort at 30 degrees C. Remember 30 degrees was probably the optimal temperature for these bacteria to produce as much acid to drop the pH as fast as possible. So that's why we selected that. Uh, and the 12 Plato was kind of middle of the road. The 10 gram per hectoliter is what we actually recommend for the pitch rate of the bacteria. Uh, for the plantarum on the left, uh, you do see that when oxygen is present, the blue line, that that influences the bacteria a little bit, not achieving as low of a pH in the resulting wort, uh, kettle soured wort. And without oxygen, you do achieve uh, close to a 3.2 pH within the 48 hour mark. Again, these are lower in pH compared to the LB1. Uh, so we see on with the LB1, uh, we do see similar things that without oxygen, the, the bacteria is dropping the pH faster. Uh, at some point, about four hours difference between those two. Um, and with oxygen, uh, it is a little bit slower, but both achieving pretty much the same resulting pH. Um, so what we can say from that is that lactic fermentation is slightly improved with anaerobic conditions. Now, when we take these kettle sours and we start to analyze the, the actual acids produced, it gets really interesting. Uh, and that's what this slide is here. Um, starting at the back and moving closer to us is my favorite way to go through the slide. Uh, so the back two, the yellow and blue are both the LP652, the plantarum. Uh, the blue without oxygen, the yellow with oxygen. And what you see uh, the third kind of row going back is the ratio of lactic to acetic acid. So here with the LP652, you see that without oxygen achieved an 18 to one ratio of lactic to acetic acid. With the oxygen presence, it's only 12 to one. 
So that right there shows you that if you're going to use the LP652, the plantarum, that you can adjust the acids produced or the ratio of lactic to acetic acid. The acetic acid is pretty much the same for both. So you're adjusting the amount of lactic acid produced by LP652 by introducing oxygen. Again, it depends on what your target is in the resulting kettle soured beer, but a difference of 12 versus 18 ratio is pretty significant for the same bacteria, the same conditions with the only difference being oxygen presence. Now, when we get up to the LB1, uh, the gray and the orangish color uh, bars, those are with uh, Brevis and you can see the orange bar is without oxygen and the gray is with oxygen. And why is this so interesting to me is you can see clearly on this, the ratio of lactic to acetic acid by just changing the bacteria from plantarum to brevis, you go from 12 or 18 down to a 1.6 to 3.8 ratio. But also you can see how you can drive the brevis to produce more acetic acid, slightly less lactic acid, but more acetic acid by introducing oxygen. So it has a pretty much, the oxygen presence has pretty much the same effect on the lactic acid production, it reduces a little bit, but with the brevis, you see really a strong increase in that acetic acid production. So depending on what your target is again in the resulting beer, you may change number one, the bacteria from homofermentative to heterofermentative. And number two, you could change from without oxygen to oxygen or vice versa from oxygen to without oxygen, depending on what your target is at the end of that kettle souring. So really, we can say that with Safsour LB1, the Brevis, uh, the acetic acid production is promoted by aeration in that kettle souring in the lactic fermentation. So just a, a brief conclusion of this first portion, which is talking really about the control factors of the lactic fermentation. How do you achieve the souring that you're looking for in the kettle? Uh, on both the pH scale and then also in the, the actual chemical analysis of the wort. Um, there's common features between the two bacteria. Uh, the acidification kinetics are relatively equivalent. Remember, we did see that plantarum was able to achieve a slightly lower pH um, in that same amount of time. And also in the analysis, we saw that obviously it is producing significantly more lactic acid, nearly twice as much lactic acid in the same amount of time. There's really no significant impact of wort density on lactic acid fermentation. Remember, we saw that there was an increase uh, from, from each step uh, in the density from 8 to 12, 12 to 16 Play-Doh. There was an increase in lactic acid fermentation, lactic acid production, also acetic acid for the, the brevis, uh, but really not a significant impact on that acid fermentation, but rather an impact on the pH because of buffering capacity. Lastly, from the common features, we saw that the optimal temperature range for both of the bacteria was 30 to 37 degrees. And with that, uh, you know, we saw that you could go warmer potentially, uh, but that if you do go to 40, you really reduce the acidification. And if you go up to 45 degrees, you're really stopping the bacteria from actually producing acid. The significant differences between these two uh, bacteria in, in terms of the kettle souring process is that Safsour LP652, the plantarum produces more lactic acid, uh, almost exclusively lactic acid, very small amounts of acetic acid in that, with that bacteria. And then that Safsour LB1 produces lactic, or acetic acid, sorry. The Brevis produces acetic acid in significant quantity and in addition to the lactic acid. The oxygen presence strongly improves acetic acid production by the Brevis, but also you could say that it does reduce the lactic acid production by both bacteria similarly, uh, albeit that the brevis really does change the profile of acids produced in that in those trials. Now, the second part of this presentation is taking it a step further. So Fermentis uh, did this applied research on the kettle souring, but then also carried out the kettle soured wort in alcoholic fermentation to see how that Kettle souring actually impacts active dry yeast, the, the yeast being used to do the alcoholic fermentation. So for this, we set up an experiment where it was the sour beer production protocol. Uh, we started with 100% Pilsen malt. Uh, for, the, for the wort itself, uh, we achieved 12 Play-Doh. 
Uh, then we cooled it down to 30 degrees for this lactic fermentation. We pitched 10 gram per hectoliter of bacteria and it was performed in anaerobic conditions. We did this with both bacteria and then also a control where we didn't kettle sour and then we did the alcoholic fermentation, which was carried out by the yeast strains uh, at 23 degrees C. The pH, the target pH was 3.5 of this wort and the pitching rate of the yeast was 50 gram per hectoliter for all the fermentations. For the alcoholic fermentation we carried out, uh, we did fermentation performance where we have the, the, the alcoholic uh, fermentation kinetics, the sensory analysis of those resulting beers, and then the aromatic compounds were analyzed uh, to identify what was present or what maybe was not. With this, we really had three different categories, three different groups of yeast uh, for this these fermentations. The first group of yeast was uh, those listed on the screen. So a lot of our staff ale yeasts, uh, K97, S33, SO4, B256, all being POF negative, uh, B2, B134, T58, WB06, all being POF positive. All of, all of these strains really perform similarly. There's the example of K97 on the screen. What you can see is that the control, which was not kettle soured, is the kind of red dashed line. The orangish yellowish line is the, the word kettle soured with LP652 with the plantarum. And the blue line is the saf sour LB1, the brevis. With this first group, even though this is just one strain that's a representative, really, whether it was kettle soured or not, it didn't really affect the, the alcoholic fermentation. You see all three of those lines very similar in their profile and nearly on top of each other. So we consider that not to be disruptive by the acid present. The second group, which is just one strain, uh, Saf Ale USO5, it's our Chico Ale yeast. Uh, this was significantly impacted by the presence of acid. So you can see the control again is the red dashed line. The orange and blue line are the plantarum and brevis respectively. And what you see is an extended leg phase. And then you also see a slower achievement of the alcoholic fermentation. Mind you that all of these fermentations ended at the same point. Uh, or nearly the same point. We'll take a look at the parent degree fermentation in a second, but the acids present didn't really affect how much alcohol was produced, just the timing. So leg phase and rate of fermentation was delayed. So that's where you can see the gap between the, the fermentation curves there. The last group was the SAF lager yeast, uh, the S23, W3470, and S189. Again, all three of these fermented similarly. And in that they were all three affected by Saf Sour LP652, the plantarum, uh, whereas the brevis and the control were pretty much on top of each other. So we can say that there's one group that really was not affected by acid present, one single strain, but a second group that is significantly impacted by the acid present, and then the lager yeast, which is impacted only by the higher amount of uh, lactic acid from the plantarum. In any case, all of these all of these alcoholic fermentations finished uh, pretty much at the same point. Again, here, mind the scale, it's only 55 to 90% ADF, parent degree fermentation. So really these little differences that you can see on the screen aren't going to be very impactful. It's maybe one or 2% for most of the yeast. Um, but you do see that they all are achieving the same terminal a parent degree of fermentation. So really, in the end, the acid isn't necessarily affecting the alcoholic fermentation in terms of the attenuation or the amount of alcohol produced, just the rate at which the fermentation carries out. What we found to be really interesting was when we started to look at the, the sensory profile of the resulting beers. So here we have one example on screen. It's uh, Saf Ale S33. It is a POF negative strain. So we don't see any phenolic character, uh, at least nothing truly significant. There's maybe two or three on the scale of 10. Uh, that's that was judged by the taste panel. We do see, however, though, that the SAFs RLP652, the plantarum, produces a really much more acidic beer than the LB1, the Brevis. Uh, so we see that both here, and then we'll also see that on the, the other image on the other side of the screen, which is here, uh, which is a POF positive strain. So B134 is a phenolic beer, uh, produces phenols. Uh, and you can see that here with the LB1, uh, the wort kettle soured with LB1. 
uh, you can see that there is phenolic character produced by this back or by this yeast. Sorry, after the kettle souring. However, when we take a look at the kettle souring performed by LP652 by the plantarum, there no longer is a phenolic character to the beer according to the taste panel. So with that, we're it's really an interesting uh, <laughs> an interesting thing uh, to see, but. Again, we're seeing that there's a stronger acidity related with the, the plantarum than the brevis. Uh, but really, this lack of phenolic character is something truly interesting. Uh, we see the POF positive yeast strain acting as if it's POF negative when it is fermenting a wort kettle soured by LP652 by the plantarum. And that's what is said here, that low POF perception for POF positive yeast strains uh, when malactic fermentation is performed with the plantarum. The, the brevis, the LB1, respects the phenolic character of the POF positive strain uh, and really gives more of a rounded flavor profile to the beer uh, compared to the LP652, the plantarum. And for both cases, the, the acidity perception is increased by the LP652, by the plantarum, by the homofermentative bacteria that's producing twice as much lactic acid as the LB1. Now, fermenters, when we saw that that lack of phenolic expression from POF positive strains, we were a bit confused. Uh, so we decided to look further into it. So we did the chemical analysis, uh, primarily for, for vinyl glycol uh, to begin with. And here you see SAFLB134, SAFLS33, SAFLT258. B134 and T58 are POF positive strains. S33 is POF negative. So you can see with the two POF positive strains, they're producing a lot of 4VG. Uh, for vinyl glycol um, in the control and then also with the kettle souring done by the brevis. However, when we introduce the LP652, the plantarum, there really is a reduced, strongly reduced amount of for vinyl glycol uh, in all the beers, uh, but especially the POF positive strains that should be producing that. Later, we studied to see if there was any for EG, for ethyl glycol which can be produced by different yeast. Uh, it was negative for all three of those. So the frulic acid that was present in the wort in all three situations was converted by the plantarum to something other than 4VG, 4EG. So you can see the control had 4VG present by the POF positive strain. The SAFs are LB1, the Brevis kettle sour had 4VG present. None of them had 4EG but the, the plantarum did not have 4 vinyl glycol. So we can say that Sapsar LP652 seems to consume ferulic acid during the lactic fermentation uh, and that POF positive character of yeast doing the main alcoholic fermentation is not detected when the kettle souring is done with the plantarum. So it's really interesting, especially when you start to look at, uh, you know, what occurs in these different uh, fermentations. So when you're using the Brevis, the LB1, the frulic acid continues through the lactic fermentation. In the alcoholic fermentation, then a POF positive strain converts the frulic acid uh, by decarboxylation to 4 vinyl glycol. If you were to introduce Britannomyces at this point, Britannomyces bruxellensis, it would convert the 4VG to 4EG, 4 ethyl glycol, uh, which is that typical Britannomyces character in beer. But with the LP652 with the plantarum, we're not really sure what happens with the frulic acid. Something is occurring during the lactic fermentation, but is not being converted to 4 vinyl glycol. We're not really sure what it's being converted to, to be honest. Uh, so this itself, this finding in the taste panel, in the chemical analysis, has driven fermentists to continue to research this uh, to attempt to identify what is happening with the plantarum, where the frulic acid is going to being converted to by the plantarum uh, to better understand what is happening. So uh, from our side, it's it was a big finding, uh, really surprising finding that the bacteria doing a kettle souring actually does not allow a POF positive strain to produce phenols because it's doing something with the precursor with the frulic acid, uh, but not converting it to 4VG or 4EG. So it's something that ferments is pursuing right now. We don't really have the answer uh, at this point, but I'm sure that when whenever we do figure out what's going on, uh, we'll be reporting on it to as many of you as we can, because I think it's really interesting. Um, so 
these are really just the conclusions to this this whole presentation. Uh, you know, sour beer diversity can be created by the lactic acid bacteria strain choice uh, for the lactic fermentation for kettle souring, and more specifically based on the following, the quality of the acid produced during lactic fermentation uh, and related to its importance, the lactic acid being a dairy character typically, um, but also we'll see on the next slide uh, that it does impact the flavor as well. Uh, and then also with the, the brevis, you do have the acetic acid production, which is going to be more of a vinegar character uh, moving forward and carrying through the fermentation. We can see that Saf Sour LB1, the Brevis, produces acetic acid, and the word aeration can modulate that uh, so we can increase the amount of acetic acid produced by uh, introducing oxygen into that lactic fermentation. With the LP652, the Plantarum, it produces pretty much twice as much lactic acid as the, the Brevis does, the LB1. And again, that's back to the beginning of the heterofermentative versus homofermentative. Homofermentative, just taking one glucose, going to two lactic acid. Whereas the Brevis, the heterofermentative, is going to take the glucose, decarboxylate. One of the molecules will be lactic acid, but the other could be either ethanol or acetic acid, depending on the oxygen concentration in the wort. Lastly, uh, the flavor impact of lactic fermentation really does play into the, the flavor of the beer, the flavor perception, and also the, the chemical compounds present. So LB1, due to its aromatic neutrality, respects the yeast flavor and aromatic signature developed during the fermentation. Remember that that did have the POF character, the, the phenol character, but also it had a more round, uh, really more round uh, flavor profile. From some feedback that I've received, uh, the LB1 may produce maybe like a slight berry type uh, character, like a dark berry type flavor, uh, but really not intense. Whereas the Safsar LP652, the plantarum, really develops a citrusy aroma uh, with potential of tropical fruit or peach like notes. Um, so, again, that's the homo fermentative bacteria really imparting a fruity, citrusy, tropical fruit, peach kind of flavor. Uh, and then also deterring the, the phenolic character from being revealed by the, the alcoholic fermentation. And uh, yeah, basically that is the last statement is that the plantarum really does affect the yeast in the alcoholic fermentation's ability to produce phenols because the plantarum is actually affecting the frulic acid, the precursor for the phenol compound. Uh, so with that, that's what I have for you today. I really, uh, you know, I think when you look at all of this information, when you look at changing the pitch rate of the bacteria, changing the temperature of that fermentation, changing the starting gravity, changing oxygen or not, changing the bacteria from homofermentative to heterofermentative, it really starts to show you how you as the brewer can control the bacteria, how you as the brewer can manipulate the bacteria to produce the desired amount of, of both the the acid present, and also the, the um, quantity of the acid. So when you switch between the two bacteria, you have either just lactic acid or a combination of lactic and acetic. And also when you oxygenate, you can affect the quantity. And then the if the brevis actually does produce more acetic acid. Uh, so I hope that uh, you learned something from this. I hope that you take this and apply it to your beers and, and you are able to produce the kettle soured beer that you want to. Um, and stay tuned for, for future information on what the plantarium is actually doing with the frulic acid, uh, given that it's not being converted to phenols of any type. So thank you. There's one question from Scott. Uh, do you have any data regarding sensory perception of sourness comparing a lower Plato, lower pH versus a higher Plato, high pH? Uh, we did not take those experiments through our taste panel. Um, it, not to say that we couldn't, uh, we just didn't because that first section where we were doing low and high Plato was really to give you the ability to to create the profile that you want from the bacteria. So with that, it was designed to for us to really 
help you as the brewer to learn how to use the bacteria in a more uh, either more aggressive or more reserved way uh, to produce more or less acid uh, in those environments. So unfortunately, we don't have the, the sensory perception for those, at least not at this time. Uh, of course, we could do that. Um, Fermentus does have a trained taste panel that we could put the beers through, but we didn't do it for, for this uh, applied research now. Uh, with that, I think that's the only question that I see. Uh, hi, Diego from Argentina. Hello. Hope you're doing well. Uh, and I believe that I'm pretty close to the amount of time that I was given. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, and for those of you who watch this uh, recorded version, uh, and if you have any questions, for sure, you can reach out to Fermentus uh, through our website or something to get more information on the studies that we're doing or that we've done. And uh, we'll be happy to help out in any way. So thank you.